Okay, so let's make a start. I'm very pleased to introduce today's presenter, Ron Wotherstein. Ron is the Executive Director of the American Statistical Association, a post he has held since August 2007. And in this role, Ron provides executive leadership and management for the association and is responsible for ensuring that the ASA fulfills its mission to promote the practice and profession of statistics. Prior to joining the ASA, Ron was a mathematics and statistics department faculty member and administrator at Washburn University in Kansas uh, from the mid-1980s. And during his last seven years, he served as the university's vice president for academic affairs. Ron has many achievements in his current role, and certainly the RSS values his collaborative approach. Today, he is focusing on the ASA's introduction of professional accreditation, in which Ron has played a leadership role both prior to and since its implementation in 2010. So it is with great pleasure that I hand over to Ron to give his presentation entitled The State of and Prospects for Professional Accreditation for Statisticians. Over to you, Ron. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Trevor. And I will start with a, a point of personal privilege to, uh, to thank you, Trevor, for the work that you have done, speaking of collaboration, to um, greatly assist the, uh, the ASA as it launched its accreditation efforts. Very much appreciated. And I thank all of you for um, uh, joining this afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss a program and really a principle about which I'm very passionate and which I've been engaged in one way or another for uh, over a decade. I'm, I, I have the scars to prove it, and I'm proud of those scars. In 1991, three ingredients the confluence of two weather fronts and a hurricane along the northeastern seaboard of the United States led to what became known as the perfect storm. And this uh, produced a, a book and a movie by the same name. Today you have uh, three ingredients, or at least many of you do, depending on where you're located. You have a, an after lunch talk, you have no face-to-face -face contact, and a fairly dry speaker. The confluence of these three ingredients may lead to the perfect nap. But while I'm speaking to you today, then, I encourage you to have tea, maybe a snack of some kind or another, because I've learned over the course of a 30-plus year uh, career of public speaking that I am much easier to swallow with food. Now, I'm going to ask you to advance to the second slide if you are um, not uh, looking online at the meeting. In the next 40 minutes or so, while you're resting, I will review the ASA's accreditation program, including its history and its current status. I'll talk candidly about what we have learned and what we still need to figure out. Most importantly, at least to me, I'll address why the presence of an accreditation program is vital, even if the program itself is not wildly successful in certain respects. I'll spend just a brief moment on the ancient history of accreditation in the ASA, which um, goes back to the early 1990s, the discussion of accreditation or certification in the association began well before that. But in the early 90s, eminent statistician and then ASA president Stu Hunter and others pushed for uh, uh, what was then called certification of statisticians. The discussion was contentious, <clears throat> excuse me, and it ended badly. Among the key points of contention was how could one hope to construct an examination that would appropriately test statistical knowledge across a, a, a discipline as vast um, and diverse as statistics? How would we agree on what such a test would cover? Who would make that decision? Moreover, one can easily imagine that a test of statistical knowledge becomes a de facto test or measure of statistical degree programs. How would it look if the master's or PhD degree graduates of Mission Creep University failed to pass the exam? 
So not surprisingly, the proposal incited members on both sides of the issue to high dudgeon. The idea went over the, like the Hindenburg, as my dad used to say, and the discussion would not surface again in a serious way in the U.S. for over a decade. In 2005, shortly after my term uh, ended on the ASA Board of Directors, but before I ever imagined being a staff member of the ASA, I served on an ASA task force uh, on, quote, recognition of the professionalism of those in business practice. I'm giving you these, the names of these task forces and so on as I go, because they, they sort of give a little insight into how these things have evolved. So this task force did things that such groups do, uh, conducted focus groups, took surveys of forums in various locations. At the end of it all, we recommended the creation of an accreditation program. We even volunteered to help get it started. Between that early 90s discussion that I mentioned earlier and this one that I was involved uh, with over a decade ago, the RSS had launched a program, as had the SSC and the, the Statistical Society of Canada, and the Statistical Society of Australia was just about to do so or had recently done. So we had a report, and this report was received and then set idle. But this time it set idle for only two years instead of uh, a decade. In early 2007, yet another task force was formed. Uh, this one was called the Ad Hoc Committee to Propose an Approach to Individual Accreditation. So you can see we're, you know, we're circling in on this. 18 months later, this committee had a detailed recommendation for the board. By this time, I was on the board and the staff as executive director, and I really began at that point in, um, in, in uh, 2008 to imagine that, that there was going to come a day soon when we might actually have an accreditation program. But before we did, we had one more group to review the work. There was concern at the time that the membership of the previous ad hoc committee might not be sufficiently well recognized by the membership, well, uh, sufficiently well known, you might say, to be the recommending voice for such a controversial proposal. So a blue ribbon panel of uh, well-known distinguished statisticians uh, conducted a thorough review of the proposal. In addition, we surveyed membership and held uh, discussions widely in many locations, and it appeared to us that there was a substantial interest among the membership in accreditation. At the 2009 uh, Joint Statistical Meetings, an intense discussion of the matter took place by the ASA Board of Directors. Fortunately, the previous executive director of the RSS, Martin Doherty, was on hand to provide an RSS perspective. After much debate, including predictions of uh, mass exodus from the ASA if accreditation were implemented, the board approved in principle a program of voluntary professional accreditation for members of the association. Those words, voluntary professional accreditation, deserve some more attention, and I will wind up this presentation with a discussion of those words. I will also mention the outcome of those predictions as well. After that, um, several more months were spent developing the guidelines for accreditation, and these were also approved by the board. An accreditation committee was formed, process and procedures were developed and tested, and uh, in late 2010, a mere 18 years after Stu Hunter's efforts began, the accreditation program was offered to ASA members for the first time. By the way, the original recommendation for the program included both a senior and junior level of accreditation, PSTAT and GSTAT, which are the uh, uh, equivalents of, of CSTAT and, and GRADSTAT in the RSS. Um, uh, they were recommended, but because of the demand forecast by the survey, GSTAT was put on hold, but was implemented ultimately in, uh, in 2014. And now we'll jump to slide three. Please, again, as uh, Trevor mentioned earlier, you'll, as we go along, uh, questions may occur to you, um, and uh, please uh, pop those into the Q&A or jot them down so that you can um, you can ask me, and I'm, I will also be very interested in 
your answers to questions uh, and your comments uh, will be, frankly, much more interesting to me than, than, than my answers will be. Um, okay, we're on slide three, as I mentioned. We used the models already in place by the RSS, SSC, and SSA to build our program. The only substantive difference at the time was to require renewal of accreditation, which back in 2010, none of the other societies were doing, but uh, or was doing, but the RSS has subsequently added such a requirement, as you know. So as just a, a brief reminder of what the, uh, the ASA's accreditation requirements are, we require an advanced degree in statistics or biostatistics or in a closely related quantitative field with a sufficient concentration in statistics. Um, for those of you not in the U.S., our, our terminology of an advanced degree means a, a, at least a, a master's degree. We also require at least five years documented experience in the application of appropriate statistical concepts and techniques, techniques uh, demonstrated professional competence, commitment to ongoing professional development, good communication skills, adherence to the ASA's guideline, ethical guidelines for statistical practice, and membership in the ASA. Here I'm going to step aside just for a moment to uh, say uh, just a couple of words about the ASA's ethical guidelines for statistical practice. You'll find those on our website, but if you wait just a few more weeks, you'll find um, a much updated version of those uh, ethical guidelines. And I do want to point out, this is not the purpose of my presentation today by any means, but we have, um, we have guidelines. The RSS has a code of conduct. Many uh, organizations do. But only uh, accredited statisticians or professional members in, in RSS uh, terminology are, are actually held to those standards in any uh, tangible sort of way. All right, so back on script, the, uh, like the accreditation programs in Australia, Canada, and the UK, the ASA's accreditation program is uh, a portfolio-based program rather than examination-based. That is, to achieve accreditation, one does not take a test, but rather submits a portfolio of credentials. These credentials are carefully evaluated against the criteria uh, of, for accreditation by the ASA's accreditation committee. Successful applicants receive PSTAT status for five years, after which they must uh, apply for renewal. Unsuccessful act, uh, applicants receive guidance on what they need to do to satisfy the requirements and to be successful on a subsequent application. And I'm pleased to say that we have um, uh, mentored many unsuccessful applicants to the point where they became uh, eventually uh, successful applicants for accreditation. And perhaps this is getting too far down in the weeds, but maybe you'd like to know the internal procedure that we use for reviewing applications. After a staff review to make sure that everything is in order, an application portfolio is assigned to three reviewers. If the, if the three agree one way or the other, that is the final decision. If there is a split vote, two additional voters are assigned. And in that case, a 4-1 vote in either direction is final, while all three to two votes are then uh, reviewed by the committee chair before final disposition. The entire process from portfolio submission to reviewer assignment to voting and to approval and, and acknowledgement is handled electronically by a system that we developed. Uh, no paper is involved at all. Here's how we summarize our accreditation program. This is, these are the words that we use um, to describe it to others. Accredited professional statistician, PSTAT, status, is given to ASA members who have an advanced degree in statistics or a related quantitative field with a sufficient concentration in statistics, who have been practicing statistics for at least five years, who demonstrate professional competence through work product and references, who have good communication skills, who are committed to continuing professional development, and who agree to abide by the ASA's ethical guidelines. That is, ASA accreditation says you are a skilled professional as evaluated by other professionals, that you have been recognized by your peers 
as combining education, experience, competence, and commitment to ethics at a level that marks you as a statistical professional. Of course, many statistical professionals do not need this credential, credential because in their workplace, these factors are already recognized. But for others, this recognition can help them improve their professional status in their work. And uh, again, that last piece is uh, quoted uh, verbatim from the, um, the uh, ASA's uh, accreditation website and in other materials that we use. All right, we're on to slide number four. Well, now as we have emerged on the other side, as it were, of the history of accreditation, we've learned a few things that, that need to be addressed or recognized. The practice of statistics is very broad, very diverse, and this is reflected in the various needs of the statistical community. When we make decisions as a society, RSS or ASA or any other society, almost nothing that we do impacts everyone. We, we do a lot of things in our societies. We, we hold meetings, but not everyone comes to the meetings. We publish journals, but not everyone reads the journals, and so on. So accreditation is, uh, is again, it's something that we, we do for members, but it obviously isn't going to be, like anything else, something that, um, that all members need. But I have learned that, that not only are we a very diverse profession, but almost no one really understands how diverse we are. We like to talk about three broad divisions, academe, industry, and government, but anyone in any of those divisions knows how heterogeneous each of those divisions is. If you, just to take one example, if you're an academic, you may be at a larger or smaller institution with different demands for research or teaching or consulting. You may be in a stat department, but maybe not. Your college may be, at least in the U.S., public or private, and each of those have its own demands and so on. We are such a diverse community that it is impossible for any one program, much less an accreditation program, to meet the needs of every member of the community. Furthermore, the, the definition of the statistical community is a definition in flux as new areas of statistical practice emerge constantly. The implication for accreditation is that we need to continually evaluate the criteria for accreditation, and we must also be asking ourselves whether different criteria or different types of accreditation might be needed for different areas of practice. Now, I have not been a government or official statistician uh, ever, but it has been pointed out to me that our current criteria may not meet the needs of official statisticians in terms of the educational uh, credentials that are needed and how one goes about developing and demonstrating one's expertise to, um, to be accredited. And uh, not only have people mentioned this to me, but the, the reality of the situation is, is that among our accredited members is a, uh, a relatively small number of official statisticians. Another issue that we run into is the demonstration of competence through examples of statistical work. Some individuals do not have authority to share their work product with us. So we've developed an interview process to re replace this requirement. We've tried it a few times with some success and are about to announce it more widely. And I'll be happy to expand on that during the Q&A. We're on to slide five now. The process of being accredited requires no small amount of effort on the part of the applicant. Um, if if uh, most of you who are listening to me today are accredited uh, statisticians, then you know this is true, and you know there's a, a financial cost as well. This has to be balanced uh, by a potential applicant against the perceived value for that effort and cost. And to be candid, we have not been sufficiently successful in communicating to the statistical community the importance of having uh, standards that indicate what it means to be a professional statistician. We, we just haven't convinced uh, uh, nearly as many people as we hope to, to uh, about the, uh, 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 that the cost uh, and effort out, uh, are, are uh, more than outweighed by the benefits. I'll talk more about that a bit later on. 
we're because of this, we're frequently asked to create uh, some kind of expedited or maybe you would call it layered process. There are many approaches that have been suggested, but in general, they involve making the application process nearly automatic for some level of individual, uh, people who have achieved certain distinctions in the profession, for example. And then one could imagine greater degrees of complexity from there where, you know, the closer you are to the, uh, the, the meeting the, the requirements minimally, the more documentation that you need to have. So uh, to go over the top with an example, the guy medal and gold winner might be automatically accredited if she wants to be, while the person with a master's in quantitative psychology and just the minimum of five years experience might need to work much harder. That's, that's the idea that's been kicked around. Um, no one knows whether that would attract more applicants and, and by getting more accredited people, build up the critical mass to give accreditation true cachet. There are, however, concerns about the intrinsic fairness of such an approach. Um, uh, the question is asked, you know, sh shouldn't everybody, regardless of how well known they might be, uh, be put through the, the, the same uh, rigorous process to be accredited? And others argue, well, um, those other people have, um, have demonstrated their credentials in other ways, and we shouldn't have to put them through the paces. So, so we don't um, we don't have answers for this. We'll be talking about them these questions again this summer when we uh, the accreditation meets at the at the JSM. But we probably should be asking ourselves regularly if we are putting up any inappropriate obstacles to accreditation. Now for slide six. We we feel kind of in the depth of our being that we ought to be able to more effectively articulate to employers the value of employing accredited uh, statisticians. For the most part, we have not been successful in reaching out with the message of professional standards to people who hire or manage statisticians. At the ASA, we came to realize that we needed to seek the assistance of uh, experts in communication and marketing to help us strengthen our method, uh, messaging and the means by which we deliver those messages. But at the same time, we wonder if any amount of effort can overcome the marketplace. It's already hard to find statisticians to hire. There's, there's more demand than there is, at least in the U.S., than there are um, trained statisticians coming out of university to meet the demands. And so if that's the, if that's the marketplace, why would an employer also want to require professional status in its potential employees. So this is, uh, again, an ongoing challenge. We feel like we ought to be convincing more employers that PSTAT is a valuable credential and that they should maybe give preference to people with that credential, but we have not um, been uh, successful in doing that. Now to slide uh, seven. Um, we get this one a lot. Portfolio-based accreditation is effective and appropriate uh, for statistics, but does not seem to be as serious as uh, exam-based approaches, at least as serious uh, uh, to some. And, you know, they argue that, you know, many professionals, doctors, lawyers, architects, nurses, et cetera, take tests. Why not statisticians? And we'll jump to slide eight. The... Uh, these questions kind of have their – the question has its own answer built into it in, in, in many respects. Those, those doctors, lawyers, et cetera, have to pass licensing examinations in order to practice in their professions, and not so for us. Furthermore, those other professions have reached agreement on the basic required uh, curriculum. In my previous – Work I used to uh, work with our uh, with our law school on its curriculum and accreditation and so on, and I can tell you you know right here sitting here in uh, just outside of Washington D.C. that there are a half dozen law schools within a relatively short drive of where I work, and while each one has its own unique features, two thirds of the curriculum is essentially identical, and, and containing the information required for students to to pass the bar exam. 
These curricula are regulated by oversight bodies within the legal profession. These same analogies, same thing happens at med schools and, and, and uh, architectural schools and so on. And we just don't have that uh, in, in statistics and no sign of that, um, that changing. Slide nine. All right, so we don't give an exam, but I don't think we should view that as a drawback. I don't think we should apologize or feel that the credential of accreditation is second rate in any respect. Portfolio-based accreditation allows us to look very broadly at the practice of statistics and be inclusive of the many types of expertise that are developed by professional statisticians. The education and experience of accredited statisticians have been reviewed by qualified peers and found to meet specific criteria that have been agreed upon by several professional associations of statisticians. It's a worthy credential. And I suspect that a great many people who may think they're statisticians couldn't obtain this credential if they applied for it. Slide 10. Here I wanna point out that uh, 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 a bit more about what I was just saying, um, that accreditation is indeed becoming a global credential. I have a, uh, a bullet point error here in my in my first slide. I took this from a from an older slide and didn't update the, the years properly. The UK has actually had uh, uh, accreditation for over 20 years, Australia and Canada for over 10, and we're winding up year six. And again, I apologize for that error. Italy, Sweden, and Hong Kong, um, uh, uh, and others, I believe, have developed or are developing accreditation programs. And in this spirit, the ASA from day one uh, recognized the credentials of UK, Australia, and Canada. That is, that statisticians accredited by those countries can also receive automatic accreditation in the US. And as new programs have, have developed, for example, in Italy and Hong Kong, we have uh, extended that same uh, 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 credential relationship uh, to, uh, uh, to them, uh, and we're just waiting on uh, details from the uh, Swedish Statistical Society before we uh, move forward on that as well. We found it extremely useful to look at the criteria used by Australia, Canada, and the UK when setting up our program but also found that the U.S. has some needs that differ from those countries um, uh, just because of differences in education system, for example. Similarly, other countries considering their own accreditation program should look closely at what others have done, but should also respond to the needs of their own communities. The process of thinking through the criteria a country or professional society will establish is an essential part of developing a, a, a program and I've worked with people in several of these countries to consider their criteria. And at the end of the day, they've often chosen either to follow the RSS or ASA models very closely. Um, so you can take from this slide that there is a, a, a broad consensus on what makes uh, for an accredited statistician. And as I'll say a little bit more later, that broad consensus serves as something that has not existed uh, in our profession prior to accreditation, and that is a definition of what it means to be a professional statistician. If someone says, you know, what is a statistician? What, is it, what does it take to really be a, uh, a skilled statistician, a professional statistician? We have a, uh, a globally agreed upon standard. Uh, the differences between the actual standards of accreditation uh, uh, among these various countries are, are minuscule. And they're so minuscule that from the ASA standpoint, um, they are meaningless and we uh, automatically take someone who is, uh, has been accredited in one of these other countries to be accredited in the ASA. So we have operated on the assumption that the more broadly accreditation spreads around the world, the more positively it will be viewed and our acceptance of, of these accreditation uh, standards from other countries is meant to help that along. Um, but 
it's still worth asking ourselves, as I do on the bottom of this slide, whether there really is value in these arrangements. Let's go to slide 11. Two things, as I mentioned earlier, were predicted when accreditation was debated in the ASA. It did not happen. Uh, first of all, there was no massive uprising about accreditation, nor was there a mass exodus from the association. In fact, membership has grown since that time, though in fairness, probably not because of accreditation. You see, we had data from a professionally conducted survey that showed there would be potentially several thousand members interested in accreditation. And clearly, as this slide shows, that has not happened. I mentioned uh, previously the concerns about the difficulty of applying for accreditation versus the perceived benefits of having it. We have heard from quite a few people who don't feel the need to spend time gathering materials in order to, as they put it, prove their worth. They're doing just fine in the profession without having the words, the letters P stat at the end of their name. And so they don't feel like it's you know, worth the time and trouble and, and expense to, uh, to proceed. For example, um, some people, especially senior people in the profession, seem to find it particularly galling to have to provide references. And it basically indicated no, they're not, it's not worth it to them. Slide 12. So accreditation did not turn out to be highly controversial, but as of yet, it has not turned out to be highly sought after as well. In my estimation, and this is just a guess, we're only about halfway to what I think would amount to a critical mass that might inspire a much broader interest in this credential. I hope during this discussion today you'll have helpful ideas or comments about what make uh, what might make it um, uh, uh, more valuable uh, to for people to join. At the risk of sounding arrogant, let me say here that I have, invested, I have invested an enormous amount of personal and professional time in accreditation. And if there was anyone who might have reason to be disappointed or discouraged about the lack of participation thus far, it would be me. However, I am not at all discouraged. Yep, I wish we had 5,000 or even, you know, i take 1,000 accredited members. But even though we do not, I still feel strongly that accreditation is an important investment in the individuals who have it and in the profession itself. Slide 13. I have argued that we need accreditation if for no other reason than it is the only place, as I mentioned before, it is the only place where the profession defines itself and where it says what it means to be a professional statistician. I return to two key words in the ASA's accreditation program, voluntary and professional. Accreditation is voluntary. It is not a requirement for ASA membership, and at present it's not required for employment, uh, but maybe only in a very few instances. It is not intended for everyone. As noted in the ASA's uh, guidelines for accreditation, PSTAT accreditation is offered by the American Statistical Association as a service to those of its members who find added value in a voluntarily obtained credential that provides recognition by peers. Not all statisticians will need or seek PSTAT accreditation, and the lack of PSTAT accreditation should never be construed uh, by itself as the lack of education, expertise, or competence as a statistician. However, holders of the PSTAT credential have voluntarily applied for this status, have submitted materials that have been carefully reviewed by peers, and found to be deserving of the credential and must periodically undergo further review to maintain this status, end quote. Implicit in the above statement is that accreditation is for professional statisticians. That is, the practice of statistics is a job for skilled professionals. Accredited statisticians have been recognized by their peers for combining education, experience, competence, and commitment to ethics at a level that labels them as professionals. Accreditation provides a measure of assurance to employers, contractors, and collaborators of statisticians and a mark of accomplishment to society at large. As I've said many times and several times in this presentation, 
One does not have to be accredited to have these qualities, of course, but accreditation proclaims that statisticians are professionals akin to doctors, architects, engineers, lawyers, etc. Why is this important? Many issues that have an impact on our daily lives, such as our health and safety, our work, our standard of living, the policies of our government, these are crucially influenced by statistics, the collection, analysis, presentation, and interpretation of quantitative data in the presence of uncertainty. Sound statistical practice informs sound decisions, leading to better policy and better outcomes. Incorrect or unethical uses of statistics can produce misleading results, poor advice, and worse choices. Prior to the uh, establishment of uh, licensure, people suffered at the hands of so-called doctors and lawyers who are not properly trained and monitored. Of course, we hope there will not have to be statistical disasters at the hands of unqualified individuals to propel forward the professionalization of statisticians through individual accreditation. Rather, it is our hope that the worldwide community of statisticians will understand the value of professional accreditation and embrace it as an essential part of statistical practice. And that will encourage people outside the profession to do so as well. This ultimately would lead to wider recognition of our profession. And so here I want to say just a bit more about wider recognition of our profession, stepping a little bit beyond accreditation for the moment, but I'll circle back to it. Because I view increasing the visibility of our profession as one of my primary responsibilities as executive director of the ASA. To some people, uh, and, and frankly, I've talked about this all over the world, so some of you may have heard me rant about this, and the rest of you are about to hear the rant. But to some people, statistics is merely a bag of tools. That's the perception. I was told this directly by the head of one of the leading scientific organizations in the world. And there's every reason to think that this perception is out there in the business world and in official statistics as well. So let me run with this tool analogy for about two minutes. I like it. I like this analogy because my dad was excellent with tools, a skill that was not passed down from father to son. Like any tool, a statistical tool has an intended purpose and a proper manner of use. And many people believe they have mastered the use of certain statistical tools and they apply them freely. But the risks are many, and I suspect that the users are often unaware of them. For example, they might not know the right tool for the job. They might feel that the training they received in one or two statistics courses qualifies them to carry the whole bag of tools. I might know how to operate a power saw, but does that make me a carpenter? They almost certainly won't be aware of all the tools in the bag and, and also which of those tools have already been replaced by better tools. And then, of course, and I have seen this in my consulting, and some of you, I bet, have seen it too, that once people learn a certain tool, they want to use that tool for everything. And it's like the old saying is, when all you have is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. I could go on, but the point is that uh, because statistical tools are so readily available via commercial and free software, there's tremendous opportunity to naively believe in one own, one's own expertise or even to feign expertise. Worse still is the belief that these tools make statisticians unnecessary and perhaps obsolete, or at best relegate us to the back room where the tools are designed and manufactured. However, in recent years, there is much reason to be hopeful. There is growing recognition that statistics is not something that can be handled casually. The reproducibility crisis, as it is being called, is drawing attention to the profound importance of good study design and analysis. The ASA's statement on p-values and statistical significance has been downloaded 115,000 times in just over three months since it, is, it, since it was published. It is being taken seriously by many outside the statistics community. Marketplace demand 
for statisticians is strong, and the number of people being trained is growing. So maybe, just maybe, these factors will encourage more people to ask what makes someone qualified to be a statistician, and accreditation may see its value increase with the asking. And now for the 14th and final slide. No talk about the state of things or future prospects would be entirely complete without raising the issue of the rise of data science. I won't launch a discussion here about what data science is, but I will mention that the ASA released a statement last year about the role of statistics in data science that has been widely viewed and well-received. My parting question then is on this slide. There are other organizations providing certification for analytics professionals, to use another term. All of the programs along these lines I have seen involve examinations, by the way. They also, I'll mention here, involve the organization providing coursework to help prepare for the examination, which I, I find uh, to be uh, at least possibly a conflict of interest. But nonetheless, it's worth asking. Should the statistics community get in the business of accrediting data scientists? Is there a strain of data scientists, something one might call a, a, a statistical data scientist, for whom such an accreditation would be valuable? Is there anyone who would find it valuable? Is this something that we should get into? Well, I just, I'll just put that out there. Thank you for giving me your time now. If, I hope, if nothing else, that you had a pleasant nap, and now that you're ready to uh, ask me some questions or make some comments. So. So in the first case, and I also see a comment on the public chat that I, I, I will read in a moment for those who, who are not online. Um, so, uh, Alan wrote, I would like, I would distinguish accreditation and continued accreditation. Much of your talk has focused on the problems of introducing accreditation when many statisticians have long practiced without it. Is there an, al an analogy with trade associations where membership is not compulsory but using a non-accredited firm means uh, buyer beware. So that's an excellent point. Um, and Alan also writes, uh, uh, many academics practicing statistics have no statistical CPD since their stats 101. You mentioned the need to persuade employers of the value of PSAT is one approach to promoting PSAT status to make much more fuss when statistical methods are misused or misreported by subject experts who thought they could do that's unaided. Um, also, uh, a very good point, um, and, uh, uh, and thanks for raising those, uh, Alan. I'll just say uh, very quickly that, it, at least in partial response to the, um, uh, the fuss about statistical methods being misused or misreported, I would um, mention a, uh, a, uh, another ASA project, uh, stats.org. I encourage you to take a look at, at that website and explore uh, what we're doing in, in that program, not only to, uh, to point out when uh, there have been uh, misleading uh, 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 reporting of, of statistics or misuse, but also to try to uh, help the, um, the, the journalism world get it right. I have a uh, – I'm going to switch over to the public chat for a moment. Uh, uh, Jeremy wrote, uh, it seems that part of the marketing effort needs to include uh, equipping already accredited statisticians with the tools to promote accreditation within their respective organization, a grassroots effort to promote the value within many different organizations. That's a, that's a great observation, Jeremy, and um, uh, perhaps at some point, you know, you and I could discuss what what that uh, what equipment uh, such statisticians uh, might need to help with that regard. And then uh, uh, Charles writes, I have a, a GSTAT and work for the federal government. I've been unable to publish much of my work. I do have several co-authored books from my previous job. Is there anyone I can talk to about going about getting a PSTAT? Uh, yep, that would be that would be me, uh, Charles. You could. Um, uh, drop me an email at ron at amstat.org. We can chat on the phone, and I'd be uh, happy to um, address uh, the questions and concerns that, that you might have. Um, ron, could I, yes, Trevor, yep. could, could I just pick up on that, that point? I mean, Please. You, uh, you, as you mentioned, uh, it's only relatively recently that you've introduced GSTAT. Uh, and I was 
was just wondering whether the ASA have put anything in place to support the progression of GSTAT through to PSTAT. And now just to give context, I, I raise this question because one of the things we found in the RSS is that our, our GRADSTAT numbers uh, have increased year on year, which is very encouraging. Um, and we're looking at how we might encourage and support the progression from GRADSTAT to CSTAT. So it would be interesting to know whether the ASA has started looking at how to get GSTAT um, on the pathway in the most effective way towards PSTAT. So I certainly don't know uh, whether we have uh, found the most effective way yet, um, but here is the, the primary tool that we will have uh, for that, Trevor, and we're, uh, we, have, we have announced this, but we're about to, about to push this a little bit harder. Um, we, um, at, at any point in time, uh, a GSTAT member uh, is invited to, um, to uh, submit their credentials as though they were applying for uh, PSTAT status, but without actually having to formally apply and, and, or pay any money or anything like that. And um, we will uh, we'll review those uh, credentials um, with them and help them figure out what they need to do. Uh, we also uh, engage our uh, our, piece, our G stats with everything that that P stats are uh, are engaged with. So they have um, reduced cost access to um, uh, uh, professional development programs, for example. Our gatherings at uh, JSM for P stats uh, invite uh, G stat participation as well. What is missing? Uh, at very least, at this point, is uh, any formal kind of, of mentorship. The um, informally, uh, the mentorship exists um, because anyone who needs to ask a question can reach out to the ASA, and if we can't answer the question, we'll, we would put them with someone who who can help them. So that's that's where we are at the moment. That's also on our. Uh, meeting agenda for um, the uh, uh, for the joint statistical meetings. Okay, thanks, Ron. Uh, I notice there are a couple of more um, questions in the public chat area. Okay, there are questions in in both the public chat and in the Q and A, and I'll try to uh, I'll try to get to all of them as fast as I can. So let me just uh, say that in the in the Q and A, uh, Caroline asks, uh, how do you assess communication skills? I think this comprises both speaking and listening. I believe that communication skills are a very important part of a statistician's job, and so no one should be exempt from this, even if they are a guy medal winner. Uh, the, uh, so it's not uh, possible uh, uh, to um, completely uh, assess that with our, um, with our process, but we get at that basically in, um, in three ways through the, uh, the, the written materials that are, um, that are submitted, and there are many uh, that are required for our, our accreditation. And then uh, it is a question that is specifically asked of the references. Um, and then uh, one additional uh, question from uh, Lewis in the Q&A. Um, uh, uh, why do you think there is no push to require some form of accreditation in order to practice the statistical profession. For example, I have previously studied for actuarial exams, and the actuarial profession is extremely protective of their accreditation. Uh, Lewis, that's a, 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 an excellent point. I, I think that the, um, the actuarial profession is, uh, while it is, uh, while actuaries uh, practice in a, a wide variety of areas, uh, it is uh, not quite as um, uh, uh, the, the span of the profession uh, is not quite as as broad, and um, uh, and they've definitely got a hold of that in in, in terms of their of, of their requirements for um, for examination. On our end, in the statistics profession, as I as I mentioned earlier, it's um, uh, uh, it's a um, 
there's so much demand for statisticians and so uh, uh, and so relative so that the number of uh, trained people is less than the uh, than the number of people applying that that um, people are uh, not willing to say uh, now I'm going to add uh, yet another um, requirement in order to get people and yes that makes you crazy right because then that they're basically saying you know that I'm willing to take the risk of filling this position with an, an unqualified um, individual. And yeah, if there's uh, approaches that we should be taking to uh, to address that, I would um, uh, I would love to get your uh, comments and suggestions on that. Um, um, uh, Giles says uh, at my organization in the UK, I'm part of a group of analysts seeking uh, government uh, statistical group professional accreditation, are there any resources that the ASA uh, has that could help? Example, online training, previous test papers available to download. Um, uh, regretfully, no. Um, we have had um, uh, we've had nothing in that in, in that area that's been done, and I, I I'm sorry that I'm not able to be helpful uh, on that. Though I would love offline, perhaps by email to chat with you to understand better what it is that that you're uh, trying to get done in case maybe I'm, I uh, am aware of resources that are not occurring to me right now. So, Giles, please uh, follow up with me on that if you'd like. Um, and then uh, Felicia, oh, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, Ron, I should, maybe should add to Trevor again, uh, to Giles, that he could equally contact um, uh, maybe Sarah Barker at the RSS with the same question. I would imagine that either the RSS may have some materials or Sarah might know um, of other sources of such material. Great. So I, uh, I have a, a question from uh, Felista, and I love this question. Um, uh, I'm a GSTAT. When I apply for a job, I always have this next to my name. What exactly are you doing out there to help employers understand the difference between me and one who has uh, no GSTAT next to their name? So, Felista, the honest answer to that question is not very much. Um, and that is not so much a matter of um, lack of interest in doing so as in um, uh, not really knowing how the resources that we have can be directed in a good way to do that. In other words, how do we, how do we reach these uh, em employers? I have a few ideas about that, um, and I'm inspired to work on them a little bit more on the basis of your question. If you have some ideas about that, um, ron at amstat.org, ron at amstat.org, uh, I would uh, love to hear um, your comments in that regard. Thanks for that very good question. Okay, so <clears throat> what, you made the point around, about um, maybe distinguishing um, um, accreditation via an exam-based approach versus the portfolio approach that you described. Um, and obviously, for, uh, I think from my knowledge of, of the ASA approach and also the RSS approach, um, typically, um, the assessment is based on material that's been submitted, uh, in your case, through your online system. Is there any um, opportunity within your approach for an interview? And have you, in considering um, approaches to accreditation, did you ever con think about uh, interviewing as part of the assessment process? Uh, that's a great uh, question, uh, Trevor. Um, so I will outline where uh, an interview has been uh, built into the process. Um, and um, But before I do, let me just say that um, the, the, this process was built with the full expectation of having a great many more applicants than we actually ended up having. And so, um, uh, we 
we wouldn't have even thought about an interview process at the um, at the beginning uh, because uh, we just wouldn't have imagined logistically how that would be possible. Now I think it's something that uh, would be uh, entirely possible if that would be it would be helpful and not um, uh, and not raise another obstacle. And you could one could imagine situations uh, in which it would be helpful. In particular, here's how we're using interviews right now. Uh, it's it's in the situation where, uh, as I mentioned earlier, individuals have um, uh, are not able to uh, to show their work product. Um, they have they work in an, in an industry or uh, in some other situation where they don't own the statistical work that they do, or they're not allowed to to, to share it with us. And uh, so what we have done in those situations, um, and we just actually kind of started testing this about uh, about a year and a half ago to make sure that it works, and we're we're happy with it. So we're about to you know announce it more broadly, but. What we do is um, we uh, set up an interview. Uh, we have two members of the accreditation committee who uh, interview the individual, and I I um, uh, I follow along on the phone just to um, just to make sure that that we handle the the, the process consistently. The interview is um, structured as a conversation among statisticians. We ask the um, the, the interviewee in advance to um, uh, to prepare to talk about two specific uh, um, projects that they have worked on, um, uh, uh, at least one of them fairly recently. Uh, and then what what takes place is uh, a conversation that you might well imagine among um, uh, uh, some colleagues uh, who are out at uh, uh, out for coffee, and one of them has, you know, here's what I'm doing at work, and the other two are just, you know, raising questions. What? How did you handle this? What do you think about that? What? What are what are some of the other issues involved? And um, it gives the interviewee, the interviewers, a chance to um, assess the, uh, you know, the, the the statistical chops, as it were. Of that uh, of that individual, and then uh, that recommendation uh, uh, from those interviewers stands in for the work product that's ordinarily required of applicants. Okay, uh, Ron. Thank, thanks for that that clarification. John Foster's question had me confused. Uh, so to clarify, particularly for Ron, who's in America. Um, the UK government has its own government statistical service, which has a government statistical group, which can include statisticians who are not part of the government statistical service. The government statistical group then has its own accreditation scheme to say that somebody is qualified, for example, to produce official statistics as uh, officially defined. And uh, that scheme... Uh, certainly recognises the RSSC stat qualification as being a useful uh, attribute, but it goes beyond just the statistics because it also includes understanding civil service policy, methods of operation. Uh, so each department in the UK civil service has its own head of statistics, and I think Giles needs to consult his head of statistics. Uh, and then within the entire civil service, there was a civil service head of statistics overall. Okay, thanks. I had, I had no idea of that, Alan, so thanks very much. It may be a useful topic for a, another um, talk to the RSS. Thanks very much, Alan. Thanks for your breakthrough <laughs> and the unmuting. <laughs> Glad you and also for I, your I contribution. Now. Much appreciated. Um, so Caroline asked, uh, did uh, she hear me say that the ASA uh, charges for accreditation? And if so, uh, might this be a disincentive to apply? Um, so yes, there is a um, a one hundred and twenty dollar charge to apply for accreditation. Um, it uh, it doesn't come anywhere close to uh, covering uh, the uh, uh, the 
costs associated with that, but that is not the reason that it's in there. And from a uh, from an organizational standpoint, we could um, uh, we could make that go away tomorrow, and it wouldn't it wouldn't ruin our budget. The um, the, the, the my hesitancy is uh, is simply uh, uh, this. First of all, um, I don't actually have um, very many people telling me that that is the disincentive. That doesn't mean that it isn't. But I just haven't heard that. And secondly, what I, I am concerned about is um, that a uh, uh, that every application that we get uh, it goes through a rigorous process. And I you know I I, I wonder a bit about whether um, no uh, no charge whatsoever for uh, submitting an application uh, could lead to um, uh, applications that aren't um, uh, aren't as rigorous as they as they need to be. But in fairness, I have no evidence that that would be the case either. So it might very well be worth doing what we scientists do, and that is to uh, conduct an experiment for a period of time where we uh, where we make that um, we make that change. Thanks, Ron. Um, just to move on, there's, a, there's a, uh, a question from Susan on the Q&A. One more question, I think, since the last one we looked at. Oh, sure. So I'll just uh, read what uh, Susan put in here in case, uh, for those of you who don't, are, are, uh, can't see that. Um, uh, and, 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 and thanks for uh, joining, Susan. Um, I'm a private statistical consultant. I find that PSTAT accreditation provides my clients with the assurance that I follow ethical guidelines in my use of statistics when consulting with them. For example, I would not attempt to hide data or mislead clients in an effort to seek approval or more business. While I can't say directly that having PSTAT next to my name has increased my business, I can say that I've been asked to participate in more forums, meetings, panels, and roundtables since my accreditation. So thanks for that, Susan. Good to hear. Um, so, Ron, one, one other point that I, I was just wondering whether you just could elaborate on. I mean, I, as you know, um, with the CSTAT, the RSS um, introduced um, renewal or revalidation, as we call it, uh, on a five-year cycle similar to the ASA's PSTAT. And we've, we've, we've actually just gone through the process such that all of those who had CSTAT at the time of um, introducing the renewal process um, will have gone through a renewal. So now everybody is in that five-year cycle. And so in a sense, we are taking stock now of the approach we use to the renewal process. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the ASA approach to renewal of PSTAT. For example, what evidence are you looking at what criteria do you use to decide whether that evidence is strong enough to renew or not? And one aspect is, is I, I guess, would be that the person is still professionally active as a statistician. And you know, you were talking about the diversity of roles of statisticians. Have you had any thoughts about the extent of statistical work that the person still needs to be doing? in order to retain PSAT. Right. So um, let me just say that um, the, uh, the RSS was uh, founded in 1834, the ASA in 1839, and I think we've been running about five years behind you ever since. Um, the, uh, we are um, we're in the process of doing those first round of renewals for people who were the early adopters of accreditation. And our main, uh, our main focus on those is um, just as really as it is in the RSS um, and as you just suggested in your question, that, um, that they're re remaining professionally active, which we look at in two dimensions, their uh, engagement with um, uh, uh, professional development, 
We want to see a an ongoing uh, uh, pattern of professional development. We have a, a, a specific uh, requirement for that, which virtually exactly matches the um, the RSS uh, requirement because you did such a, a wonderfully thorough job of, of thinking through various kinds of, of, of professional development. Um, but there's also the issue of, you know, maintaining um, statistical practice in, in some way. Um, and we haven't set a, a hard and fast rule for that. Um, informally at this point, you know, we're, we're still looking at someone, you know, we're thinking that someone is spending, you know, still half their time um, doing uh, statistical things uh, that um, they have, um, that, that they're, and they're doing professional development and so on, that they're uh, remaining um, uh, uh, professionally active. The, uh, uh, we haven't tested that against the application yet to see whether that is a, um, a reasonable rule of thumb. Um, but, you know, there are things that, that aren't, going to, aren't going to fly. Um, if, if I were accredited, um, the, uh, I, I would not like it if, um, uh, if I could get renewed right now because I know what I've done for the last five years. I feel like it's been very important what I've done for the last five years, but it hasn't been um, practicing statistics as a, as a professional. Um, I, I don't crunch a lot of data. I don't get um, involved in great discussions about how to design experiments. Um, so I am, I'm no longer practicing statistics in a way that would, um, uh, would qualify me to be a, uh, an accredited statistician so I would expect not to be uh, renewed. Um, at this point, uh, Trevor, we're still uh, new enough in this whole renewal business that, um, uh, that we don't have uh, good data on, on what we're going to see. But let me just close with this, this final comment is that our, um, our default position is that the individual is um, maintaining uh, uh, their, their statistical practice. Um, uh, whereas when you, you know, when you are applying for accreditation, that's sort of the, the, uh, the, uh, we, we want you to prove to us that you're doing it. We, uh, that you're, that you're qualified to, to have the P stat after your name. Um, of course, we're asking people to provide enough information, uh, but we're assuming that people are continuing. And so, if they if they don't provide us enough uh, information, we don't we don't discontinue their their status, but we will ask them some follow up questions, and, and and perhaps that might involve an interview or something at that point. Uh, obviously, most important of all, Ron, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you lived up to your reputation as being an excellent speaker, and I'm certain that uh, none of the people present took a nap during your <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful for all those who hold, held on all this time, and I will be grateful for any comments that you folks have uh, in the in the poll today. And let me say thank you for the opportunity. And it's very important to uh, for me to say thank you again to the Royal Statistical Society, which has been a leader in a great many things, which um, uh, which the ASA views as a uh, a, a profoundly important. A partner um, in the uh, uh, in our mission, and uh, it's been a uh, a pleasure to work with um, with Martin and Heatan on a variety of things, and also uh, as I mentioned at the outset with uh, with Trevor, who among a great many other things, also served on our accreditation committee for a great number of years. So thanks for this opportunity, and thanks for your uh, partnership with the ASA.